Smartcast. You are listening to a Mint production brought to you by HD Smartcast. Hello and welcome to Why Not Mint Money. We have a very special episode lined up for you today, um, focused on Women's Day, and our guest today is um, one of the most eminent women that India has in uh, financial in the financial services space. Um, this is Neel Gurate from the Mint Money team. Joining me is my colleague Satya Sontanam, and we have with us Usha Thora, former Deputy Governor at RBI. Usha has worn many other hats, and uh, even now uh, has uh, currently wears many other hats, such as uh, the head of the Mutual Fund Advisory Committee. But all of that we will discuss further along in this uh, episode. So welcome, Usha. Thank you, Neel. Thank you, Satya. Welcome, Usha. Hi, welcome to Why Not Mint Money, a personal finance podcast where we help you understand basic money concepts and share strategies for you to build your wealth. So let's get started on your money journey. Usha, so let's begin um, the start of your career. You studied economics at the Delhi School of Economics. What got you interested in economics and finance in your student days? How common was it for women to study economics and pursue a profession? in this field in those days well uh, neel i did my b honors in economics from lady shiram college in 1969 and my ma from delhi school of economics in 1971 uh, it it was quite a popular subject amongst uh, women even in those days although banking and finance was not particularly a preferred choice when i was a student because i was in delhi and the milieu in delhi was all uh, either getting into the ias or going abroad for further research so i think banking and finance was considered a bombay thing and not a delhi thing those days anyway you must also remember that in 1969 1969 this was a democratic socialism the objectives of poverty eradication central planning were ingrained in the value system and in the education system as a young person idealistic and concerned about the poverty and inequality one saw amongst nations of the world and within the country one was naturally drawn to economics <clears throat> there was also a strong belief uh, and that had something to do with the, the the leftist orientation of the education itself which that to make a difference you had to deal with the underlying economic relationships in society rather than with the social or the institutional ones and that these had to be changes to be done at the macro level rather at the micro level actually i loved mathematics but i did not want to do either science or go ahead with maths and so economics it was and finance was actually something unknown in the course in delhi university we only studied monetary economics and public finance there was a huge belief in the uh, socialist pattern of development and the belief in central planning was very strong aspects like caste and community were the sociological aspects of development were quite outside the radar and in delhi quite a few students chose economics and uh, aspired to get into the delhi school of economics a very prestigious place to study in india and whether you were going to do the ias or not it was something that most people really you know tried to go get into if they were doing ma at the ma level if they were trying to do Uh, you know, for the post uh, graduation in economics. So this was the you know the environment at that time, and um, that's how I got into economics and to Delhi School. So would you say that the environment has changed dramatically now? Um, there is all of these examples of people getting paid huge amounts in finance, of being entrepreneurs. Uh, startups are celebrated across the board. so that old focus towards academic economics or uh, development focused economics has that shifted dramatically towards capital markets and finance even among oh, i think i think so the entire environment has uh, uh, changed quite a bit uh, today for women uh, banking and finance is considered is a preferred choice just as in those days also it's not considered to be too it's it's you know it's considered to be a safe and a secure environment to work in and it can be adapted to your needs so you can be very ambitious and do a lot and yet you can manage fairly okay you know between the house and the 
job. So I think banking and finance definitely con continues to be a preferred choice. But what you say about the environment is totally right, Neil. I think uh, basically uh, there was a service orientation uh, in our approach to a career those days. And uh, particularly from the kind of uh, background, I suppose it was a bureaucratic background that we, many of us came from or an academic background. It was, there was never a scope, I mean, I never imagined a job in the private sector. And private sector was, the role of the private sector was also not so high because it was a different model of development. So in some senses, what you see today is, yes, it's a very, very different world. Right. Usha, so you joined the RBI in 1972 uh, and eventually became deputy governor in 2005. Can you tell us a little bit about central banking and how it changed over the decades, especially since 1991? Is there a significant presence of women in um, Indian banking and finance more generally at the higher levels? For me, it was a long time, lifetime commitment and employment with the Reserve Bank of 38 years. Originally, when I joined the Reserve Bank, I had imagined that uh, I would, uh, I wanted, uh, you know, I wanted uh, to really uh, look at economics in actual practice and not secondhand, that it was something first-hand uh, experience I would get and then I could do research and then move into banking again and you know I had visualized some kind of a to and fro and also doing research but that never happened and I continued to remain in a very operational area but remember also that out of the 30 years 38 years of my career 19 were before 1991 and 19 were after 1991 so I've really seen the before and after you know, very closely. And uh, before 1991, it was an era of planning, like I said, and credit was also planned. And in 1991, of every 100 rupees of deposits mobilized by banks, 38.5% was SLR. They had to be invested in government securities. The cash reserve ratio was 10% of your demand and time liabilities. There was an incremental cash reserve ratio of 25%, uh, 15%, sorry which meant only that 37% was left for credit, of which 40% of the credit went to the priority sector and 12% or some other things, you know, uh, like food credit, fertilizer credit, it went for designated sectors. So it was a very minimal percentage uh, of the total funds available for the private sector. I mean, you people won't even imagine, but interest on loans to private sector at that time uh, was something like 17 to 23, 24 percent and government bonds would be at 9 percent. So there would be about a 10 to 11 percent difference between the interest rate on loans to for private businesses other than priority sectors because there all in interest rates was controlled and on mm -hmm. government uh, borrowing also interest rates was controlled. So you had this uh, administered interest rates and uh, there was a cross subsidization because you charged higher interest rates on that smaller and smaller share of the pie that was there for the private sector. And RBI's role was literally to allocate and ration credit. So it was really control over the availability and the cost of credit, RBI's role. And to negate the impact of a higher and higher fiscal deficit by increasing the CRR. So the CRR became the only tool really of monetary policy and on the foreign exchange side it was rationing of foreign exchange through foreign exchange control. So this was the scenario for most of the period till uh, 1991 and uh, I think the focus at that time was expansion of banking into the underserved areas, branch expansion was a huge thing, nationalization of banks and public sector. And the 1970s and the 1980s, early 80s, saw a huge expansion of the banking. So this was, I would say, the scenario. And when uh, the liberalization happened, it was all the dismantling of controls in all the areas. So whether it was government borrowing through auction system, foreign exchange markets through a dual exchange rate system, and then a unified market-driven exchange rate, with a certain amount of, of course, uh, managing the uh, extreme volatility, financial sector reform, 
allowing the entry of private sector in banking, liberalization of interest rates gradually, and liberalization of the external sector. These were all part of the macroeconomic reform one saw from the vantage point of the Reserve Bank. In an overall environment where uh, government also may undertaking major reform like liberalizing trade, reduction in tariffs, domestic tax reform, foreign di direct investment, foreign institutional investment. So it was a major, major period of change and I was very lucky to be part of the critical changes both in the foreign exchange markets and in the government borrowing. Uh, you know, uh, in the debt management cell and later on in the uh, regulation and supervision. So, in a sense, uh, it was a very exciting times and what was constant was change and we were all going through uncharted territory. We had to understand what the new paradigm was and it was constantly learning. So, I, I personally feel, you know, that was a tremendous period for uh, those of us who were privileged to be there at that point in time. And um, in the Reserve Bank, the f intake of women, I wouldn't say has been huge, but it was fairly reasonable and the environment was quite supportive of uh, uh, women. In the case of the public sector banks, uh, one uh, study actually showed that, uh, uh, you know, the share of women in the officer category, it uh, went increased from something like 7 percent in 2001 to about 14.4 percent in 2011. But in the executive uh, category, I think the figures show that uh, the women, you know, were not very uh, significant. So there was some, obviously they were reaching uh, officer cadre, but they were not re reaching the top, uh, you know, share of say general managers or you know, beyond that. So I think many interventions are needed to uh, remedy this situation. Right. Uh, Usha, just to finish off that point, and I'll hand over the next question to my colleague Satya. Um, you contrasted the earlier state-controlled economy with today's more market-oriented one. Um, and you've told us that there has been, you know, the presence of women in uh, public sector banks, but not at the very top levels. Um, what is the case with the private sector, in your opinion, is there more mobility there? No, or is I, I don't think. I don't think I was really making much of a difference between the public sector and private sector. Private sector, maybe the opportunities uh, were different in different banks. Um, uh, the data which I was mentioning was actually related to both. Although the Kandelwal committee focused only on the nationalized banks, and uh, there too, the results were not very different. So I think even in the private sector, uh, there have of course been very dramatic uh, uh, cases, I mean there have been very significant personalities at the very top level in many, many banks. Uh, but if you take it in terms of the percentage of the total people in the executive cadre, I don't think you will find uh, that, uh, you know, the number is that high as say, say in Southeast Asia for example, where I have visited so many central banks and others where the number of women in very senior positions, I would say, is much higher. Right. So then, would you like to ask the next question? Yes, Neil. I hope the situation changes soon in India as well. But we have to do a number of things, Satya, for that. <laughs> for example? Well, uh, in fact, while uh, sort of preparing for this, I think this whole business of flexible working hours you know, part-time job assignments, split location positions, job sharing, and uh, addressing the issues pertaining to women at work, the whole uh, facility of daycare and creches. I remember, you know, my mother, I'm living right now, she's here, she's 94 years old, and she ingrained in us a belief that uh, women should be financially independent and, uh, you know, you should not make the home the be-all and the end-all of your existence. And, um, but she saw her children, daughters and her three daughters, you know, struggling. So she started a working women's crash in Chennai when I came here on a posting ah. from Northeast. And she said this is to help uh, women that, you know, realize their uh, potential and they don't stop working just because they don't have a reliable facility. So I think those kind of things are tremendously important. 
So also to get allow women to get back into the workspace after having taken off for child, you know, new, uh, uh, sort of upbringing. And <clears throat> elderly care, everything is all comes on the woman quite a bit. So I think, I think it's an active intervention is required. Otherwise, it's not going to change. Absolutely, Usha. Yeah. You as a trustee uh, of the Indian Cancer Society uh, have worked towards helping cancer patients in India, particularly to, uh, towards um, you know those who cannot pay for the treatment. Uh, what are the areas uh, do you focus on now? Uh, the, the Cancer Cure Fund of the Indian Cancer Society, which I've been heading for the last, uh, uh, I've been heading the vertical you know, relating to the Cancer Cure Fund. Um, has been a, it's now been a decade of actually working and we've helped about 11,000 uh, plus patients for meeting their cost of treatment in a very holistic way up to 5 lakhs per patient is the commitment and total amount about 175 crores has been so far discussed very unique uh, model of funding it was through a mutual fund and uh, where philanthropy was an asset class and the returns uh, on the on your principle which was protected uh, were surrendered by way of your contribution to the cancer care fund. So that was what gave us a sustainable, sustainable source of funding over the period and that could enable me to plan our um, you know efforts and the scale and hire people and put in software and improve efficiencies in a manner that it became very very professional very very slick and very outcome oriented. So I feel that, um, at, and then we've also started using artificial intelligence for selecting patients because the Cancer Cure Fund supports patients uh, whose uh, survival uh, chances are more than 50% so that you prioritize uh, you know, very limited funds. And that also makes you feel a little bad because you can't obviously help everybody who uh, has a need for mon money for treatment. So while the Cancer your fund um, experience is still going on and it's doing very valuable service through hospitals all over the country. I think the need for uh, creating a financial product which will actually uh, give a protection to larger numbers to clearly what can only be an insurance product is something that you know we have taken our attention to the next level and hopefully we'll soon shortly be announcing you know one of the insurance companies who has helped us, who has sort of worked also very hard on this, will be coming out with this product. It will be a very affordable product for families. Great job there, Visha. Uh, our best wishes for that. Usha, you currently head the Mutual Fund Advisory Committee of SEBI. Among mutual fund distributors and investors, there is something of a skew towards men. Is there something that the regulator or the mutual fund industry can do to bring more women into this industry, both as professionals and investors? <clears throat> Satya, like we discussed earlier, this is not only true in the mutual fund industry. In the entire BFSI sector, you do have uh, this. Why BFSI sector? If you look at now women's participation rate, rate in labor force, it has decreased significantly. Fortunately, in the banking and financial sector, I suppose that has really not happened. What has happened in the rest of the economy? <clears throat> so there is a need, a greater opportunity and need for women to be brought into the uh, BFSI industry. No doubt about that. Secondly, I feel there is a distinct advantage that employers will get by bringing them in. And that is because their uh, the attrition level, uh, their goal, women you know, have goals which are goes beyond advancement of their own careers, especially in terms of family and uh, societal uh, commitments. So if those are fulfilled, then they will be much more likely to stay on and develop themselves and contribute. So I think there are distinct and they sort of give that benefit of that aspect of, you know, their natures to an organization, which makes it better in terms of a, a good place to work in. So I feel bringing in women into the BFSI sector will be a hugely beneficial thing. Satya, I think, uh, uh, I'm not sure this is an area which requires regulatory intervention. It is something that can be uh, done as a self, uh, you know, kind of uh, initiative by the industry, by 
the banking industry, the mutual fund industry, and also by associations like AMFI, uh, you know, to really uh, promote the kind of aspects to provide that kind of facilities and infrastructure, which will enable more women to really enter and remain there. So I think definitely interventions are needed and it would be really advantageous, I feel, for the industry to do. As far as investors are concerned, I think that's a different, totally different uh, area because most of the women I find, even the most educated, really uh, have no clue about personal finance. So I think uh, that's not at all a good situation. I think every woman has to become aware of uh, the, you know, what are the lifetime needs, plan resources properly, equally between the husband and the wife and you know, and this is something that I think women should definitely uh, definitely become a part of and even for her own self, even if she's single or not, I think it's extremely important that a woman uh, gets educated financially and plans her own uh, financial needs and for her own life. Absolutely. So, uh, on that note, uh, any suggestions for first-time investors, particularly uh, for men in India? <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, one thing is don't do anything. Don't invest in anything you do not understand, <laughs> even if that uh, provides a higher return. And uh, do keep aside funds for emergency and rainy day and safe and liquid assets. Don't put everything where uh, when you go to take it out, you find prices have dropped or the market has fallen. And make planning for specifically, you know, bulky <coughs> expenses um, and don't the markets go down if your original decision was based on long term trends. Secondly, definitely don't uh, get into a debt trap and over borrow because that also sometimes people end up doing. I would say as far as mutual funds are concerned, I think the attempt of uh, SEBI and mutual fund advisory committee is to make sure that everything is uh, true to label and uh, risk uh, riskometer or the risk profile of the fund is you know as transparently available as possible so just because a particular particular fund house is launched a mutual fund doesn't mean that the risk is same in all the funds you see there seems to be a kind of belief that uh, you know you it's like investing in that name it isn't because it's only as good or as bad as the underlying instrument in which that money is invested. And that is what is the regulation that you have to have different categories of uh, mutual funds. And uh, the investor has to understand quickly as to what kind of a risk profile uh, she or he has and according to that choose the fund. I think that is really important. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Usha. It was lovely speaking to you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, have a nice day. That's it, folks, for this episode. Thank you so much for joining us. If you have any feedback about this episode, you can reach out to me on Twitter at Actors Day, that's A-C-T-U-S-D-D-E-I. Or you can reach out to Satya um, on Twitter at, at Satya Sontanam. Or you can email us at mintmoney at livemint.com. This was a Mint production brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast.